Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com backslash A-H-T-T. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Podcast episode 144. Dexter Henry, Brian Fonseca here mm-hmm. for another episode. And we have a guest today. This is our second politician ever to join the show. Uh, mm-hmm. It's a guy I've known for a little bit from my time working with News 12, uh, Jamal Bailey, New York State Senator for District 36. Jamal, what's up, man? What's going on, fellas? Happy to be here. Happy Sunday. Happy happy day. Happy week. Whenever this is being in, I'm happy to be here, y'all. Thank you for having me on, man. Oh, man, sure. no, we're, we're glad to have it. Anytime we could get uh, somebody who, you know, is doing good work for the community, also a fellow New Yorker, as we mm-hmm. all are, um, it's always a beautiful thing to do it. So whenever we have journalists on here, Jamal, we always ask them how they got into the sports journalism game. You being a politician, we got to ask you, as a native New Yorker, Bronx guy, how did you get into politics? How did that all happen? Well, I mean, like, so I already always cared about my community, about how the way things work. But I was a senior at the University of Albany, and I applied for an assembly, an internship in the New York State Assembly. And the assembly member from my area is a gentleman by the name of Carl Hasty. Who, he happened to be in his second term at, uh, as the assembly member, and he always picked interns who were from his district. And mm. so I, I, I knew who Carl was. I, mm. I, I didn't have a relationship with him at the time. But he always wanted to make sure he picked kids from his neighborhood because, you know, he felt that it would be a better experience for you to work with somebody that was in your community. And I'll tell you a story about Carl Hasty, who is now the speaker of the New York State Assembly, the first African-American in the history of New York State to be the speaker in, in, in the history. So when you think nationally, Nancy Pelosi, for those of you who are not uh, involved in New York politics, Carl Hasty, so to speak, is the Nancy Pelosi of New York State, and he's the first black person, period, to do that. So, Carl, I walk into his office, and I'm thinking, this is my first internship. You know, how do you do it? What do you do? Do you? I'm like, hey, Mr. Hasty, um, you know, do you need some coffee? Do uh, you need some coffees made? He's like, sit down. <laughs> it was about to get real. It, it got it got very real, right? He's like, <laughs> three things. Mr. Hasty was my father. My name is Carl. Two. I'm an adult. I can get my own coffee, but I don't drink coffee. I drink tea. Three, <laughs> it, you learn. This is not, this is not, and again, this is not, and I'm going to editorialize this. He, he didn't say this, but I'm going to say that making copies and getting coffee, there's nothing wrong with that. But what Carl told me was, he said, you're here to learn the legislative process. This is mm-hmm. what you're here for. This is why you apply for this internship, and I want to do my best to cultivate that. So it, from there, it was, it was on, so to speak. Um, I, I got a chance to, to look at legislation, uh, help to draft a bill that eventually passed. And when that bill passed, um, now Speaker Hasty Carl, as he pre- prefers everybody to call him, he gave me a copy of the pen certificate, right? Mm-hmm. A pen certificate is what happens when, when, when a law is, when a bill is, is memorialized and, it's, and it passes both houses of the legislation and it's signed by the governor. You get something to memorialize it. It's a copy of the actual law that's signed in. Now, it was bill number 89534 of the 2003-2004 legislative session, right? I still have that pen certificate. That's Carl gave me a copy of it to remind me what the legislative process was. So from then on, I, I just I stayed involved in government, had a couple of ranks, um, uh, positions in party, state committee member, district leader, critically important positions in party politics. And then when my predecessor, Ruth Apple Thompson, when she left to take a job at the governor's office, Ruth had been doing phenomenal work in the space of criminal justice, which I, uh, I've learn to like emulate a little bit. Um, I figured nobody, who else but me. I, I, I grew up in this community. I, I am from and for here and I feel and I felt and I still feel to this day that I can provide an incredible representation for the community that I love. And um, by the grace of God I've been able to be here um, two terms and I and I'm running um, for my third coming up coming November. Yeah, and we're, and we're wishing you luck because you've done a great work. I wanted one follow up on that because I'm glad you told that story about 
you know, having that opportunity with the internship to get in. But how important was it for you, Jamal, to have somebody that looked like you that was there from your community? We always talk about this on this podcast, whether it's sports or whatever. Visibility is important, right? And for you to see that, that had to be really empowering for you in that moment. Real life, like, if you can't see it, you can't be it. It yeah. sounds cliche. Like, I, I went to the Bronx High School of Science, right? And I did not have a black male teacher until junior year of high school. Damn. And I was GNT mm. program. I was in all of this. I was in all of these programs after school and whatever it was. But I did not have a black male teacher, classroom teacher, a gym teacher, but classroom teacher until junior year of high school. So like, mm. it's not something that if you don't see it, then it's not in your consciousness. And I see it next thing in the background, you see, like Black Panther, rest of these Chadwick, man. Yeah. Yeah. And just, like young kids, like my, 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 my youngest daughter, she reads ABC Mouse. There's a Black Panther story that she reads incessantly on ABC Mouse. Um, she always talks about the part that Claw gets away, but, you know, she finds that to be entertaining. But, but like folk, black and brown folks, when they see somebody on that screen that looks like us, I don't know what people don't realize what that does for our psyche. And to have somebody, uh, his second term, at the time, he's under 40 years old, got a little swag to him. He's saying, young brother, you're from the neighborhood. And, you know, in contrast to what politics generally is and was, a lot of times people, they, they, they're afraid of young leadership because, like, yo, I, they're going to take my job. They're going to take my spot. Carl was always one who said, no, no, no. We got to bring the next generation along. We got to do that starting now. And so you're right, like, seeing somebody in a position, being able to uh, that can affect change, but that looks like you, it's, it's nothing greater. Nah, no, no un, undoubtedly. So, a lot yeah, going and, and on. Oh, go quick, ahead, bro. Go quick, ahead, Jamal. yeah. There's, there's something that I wanted to wanted you to expand on that you mentioned there, because I think, yeah, your pinned tweet is still about three years ago, you being the youngest member of uh, the New York State Senate at the time. I don't, is that still true, one? Uh, listen, I, I, I'm, a, I'm an old man, you know, um, <laughs> Julia Salazar and and um, and Zelno Amari and, and um, Jessica Ramos and Alessandra Biaggi, James Scoofus, they came in and they 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 kind of put me into the Middle Ages, you know. Um, <laughs> but at the time, I, it, like that that pin tweet that was about raise the age, and if you want, I, I guess I can talk about that. Yeah, because if you could expand on that process, because I mean, this is something that we've all had to fight at some point in our careers, right? When is the time where we're going to be able to break in and not just be the young person that's here? Like, when are we going to be allowed to sort of have that breakthrough? And for everybody, it's different. So what's your journey in at one point, you know, being the youngest member and, you know, still having to grow throughout all that? Well, it's important that and it's something I say to high school students when I speak, or, or middle school students, or elementary students, there's no arbitrary age for leadership, right? We have ages for voting, but there's no age where, where you automatically automatically become a leader, right? Like, oh, you're 40, that means you're good. No, there are people who are, who are 40 years old who are not leaders, right? There are people who are 40 years old in government who are probably not leaders, right? If we're going to be honest. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I felt that my youth was what could be used as a strength in that specific context because we were talking about raising the aid for criminal responsibility. And at that time in New York State, in, in that time, New York State and North Carolina were the only two states in the entire country that treated juveniles as adults in the criminal legal system, right? And it, and it was something that I just, I was like, wait, you've been to a high school lunchroom? You ever, you ever, you ever spoken to a, a juvenile to treat them as an adult? In the vast majority of crimes, we're not talking about the most violent felonies. We're not talking about, you know, certain heinous crimes. But but other crimes, like, there has to be a different way that we look at younger folk. Because if we're really trying to rehabilitate those who are, you know, who are doing the wrong thing, right? Um, mm -hmm. we're, we're doing ourselves a disservice by throwing them away so early. And people aren't disposable. So, that like, I think that's the, that's the, that's the crux of the matter. But being young, sometimes you have to... Um, you know, show them that, that, that you're here for a reason. The people, the people, I, I want a five way primary over 55% of the vote. I, 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 like nobody, nobody gave me anything. I worked incredibly hard. Um, and of course people lift you up. You don't do anything by yourself. I want to be very clear about that. Right, I'm, right. 
I'm not a bootstrap theorist kind of guy. But, you know, Neither am I. I. <laughs> we, we aren't either. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not Clarence Thomas or anybody like that who, 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 who benefits from affirmative action and tries to get rid of it, right? I, I, I benefit from, from Speaker Hasty and so many other people in, in, in this space who, who are mentors and, and role models to me. But at the end of the day, you have to put in work in order to be successful. And, and I, I've worked really hard. Um, I still have a lot more to do and a lot uh, and a longer way to go. But being young and, and having a certain worldview, I think, has made me a much better elected official um, and just being who I am, you know. No, nah, that, that's dope. And that was a really good question by Brian about your youth and, and just being able how you had to navigate that also getting into the game as well, too. But let's talk about some recent stuff, Jamal. The last week uh, you've seen you've seen this a lot of. Black folks, people of color said last week was pretty much exhausting. Um, and I will say it's exhausting being black in this country that has been racist. It's not, I love being black. There's nothing exhausting about being black, but living in a country where there's racism, that is exhausting. And when we saw what happened with Jacob Blake being shot seven times in the, black, in the back, um, and then we saw the strike by the Milwaukee Bucks in the NBA, Two-part question here, Jamal. First, your, what was your reaction, obviously, to the shooting of Jacob Blake at the hands of the police uh, in Kenosha? And then also, what was your reaction to how the Bucks and the NBA responded in striking and not playing uh, earlier last week? Well, the Jacob Blake is just like, the response is, when does it end? When do we get the benefit of the doubt, right? And especially seeing that contrast with other, with other videos, you, you know, in the Twitter sphere or online, you see... Um, this, this, this gentleman who happens to be of Caucasian descent yelling at the top of his lungs, screaming at a police officer with a weapon drawn, and they do nothing. Another another gentleman reaching for the weapon, the service weapon, while an officer is on duty while while trying to be restrained, and, and nothing happens. I I, I I grow increasingly frustrated with the fact that it only seems to be us when when that don't get the benefit of doubt that that these uh. Contextually based situations only happen when it's us, right? That that to me frustrates. Um, look, I don't know what it's like to be a member of law enforcement, and and despite the fact that I'm the lead sponsor of all this police reform, I don't have a, I, I don't have a, uh, 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 I, I don't dislike the police at all. I respect the job the police do immensely, right? But what I don't like, and what I can't respect, is consistent racism and no acknowledgement of it happening, right? Mm -hmm. Like, as an elected official, you're always asked to, if one of your colleagues does something wrong, they run to you the next day, what do you think about what person next did, right? Mm -hmm. As journalists, right? Like, you're, you're, asked all, you're asked all the time, well, what about journalist X? How do you think they handle that, right? Yep. Well, how, did, how did you feel about what Rob Parker said, right? Like, what, like did you, did you, what would you have said about that when he's dealt with RG3, right? Like, you, you get asked that stuff all the time, right? Mm -hmm. I get asked that too. Yep. Officers, they don't seem to, if they're asked that, they don't answer it. Um, yeah. As far as Milwaukee goes, I, I've never been happier to, to not see basketball in my life. Like, straight up. Like, it was, it was, it like, so it, it, the interesting thing was on the 26th, it was my birthday. I was like, I, I took a day uh, at home, chilling with the kids, and I turned the game on, and I'm and I'm and I'm noticing like NBA TV. I'm like, oh, it's, it hasn't started yet. Hmm. And when things like no happen, I start looking at Twitter and looking at your phone, and you're like, oh, the Milwaukee Bucks are not coming out. I'm like, okay, <laughs> right? Like, like, let, like, let's let's close the deal. Let's let let's let let's make this real. Now, in addition to that, they got. The, it, the the governor of Wisconsin to, to, to bring a legislature back to vote on some of these police reform bills, right? Mm -hmm. Like like the power in the people can never be denied. But I want to make sure we give out give out shout out to the sister, sisters in the struggle. Yes. The WMA, yes. Because like Maya mm -hmm. Moore, one of my favorite ball players of all time, or female. Mm -hmm. The truth, first female ever on Jordan Brand, just the real deal. Um. She stopped a Hall of Fame career in the middle of it to make to fight for the exoneration of Jonathan Hyatt, which one that she won. Um, the players on the Atlanta Dream going against the owner of their own team, like like they yeah. were sure that yes, the Bucks did something that was a pendulum shift. But the women in the WNBA, 
they've been they've been you know much like unfortunately what's happened in society uh, women don't get the credit that they deserve I want to make sure that I continue to uplift and make sure that the WNBA gets the credit that it deserves in terms of consistent activism but all in all it was a great day it was a great day on August, August 26th no, for, yeah. and happy birthday by the way happy belated birthday man yeah, by the way yeah true <laughs> And we talked about that a little bit in a special that we did last week where we were talking about just the players protesting in general like that. And I made the point that I feel like, well, obviously we have to step in and obviously help these players at the end of the day, NBA players, uh, uh, WNBA players, whatever the case may be, whoever's protesting. Like we obviously have to help them because I think that we can't continue to expect them to sort of raise awareness for these issues and push the envelope forward because they need our help. It's too much. Like, I'm 26 years old, and a lot of the players are around my age. A lot of them are even younger, and they have to deal with, you know, taking care of family members, being trapped in a bubble, raising awareness for these social causes, donating money here, taking care of this person. It's too much. So what what steps do you think we have to take as people in order to sort of bridge that gap and do our part and help out the athletes in order to really make this change? It's gotta be, we got to be consistent, right? It's one of these things where – you go to a school for a day, you tell the kids that they're great, you get a nice picture. If you don't go back to that school, what have you really done, mm-hmm. right? Like, mm-hmm. like, like you, you plant a seed, right? Like, essentially, that's what, that's what you do. You plant a seed. That's great. Now the, now, the seed can grow if you do what? Give it sun, give it nourishment, and you give it water. If we're not consistent about nourishing, like, these thoughts and these ideas – they're not going to, you know, continue. Like, as an elected official, I want people to vote in every election. Like, yeah. you, the, the cliche of, a, uh, you know, they wouldn't elect you dog catcher. Yo, if, like, there was a dog catcher election, you should vote in it. Like, straight up. And you should figure out who's running for dog catcher. What do they want to do as dog catcher, right? How would they make dog catching more humane if that's your thing, Right. Like, like, we have to be more critical consumers of information. And, like, the, the, the days of a chicken in every pot, that's not, like, that's not it anymore, right? Well, this is it's transactional. If you do this and you get this. No, we got to, we have to make people understand why their vote counts. Why mm-hmm. it's, for example, not to go with a partisan lens here, but I'm going to say this, right? I'm a Democrat, and I think that the worst thing from the George W. Bush presidency it wasn't the Patriot Act. It wasn't the weapons of mass destruction. It was the fact that he, that he was able to appoint conservative jurists to the Supreme Court that have affected jurisprudence in America for years mm-hmm. and years to come, right? Citizens, mm-hmm. Citizens United, corporations of people. Mm-hmm. I don't know about you, but, you know, corporations mm-hmm. definitely are not people where, where I come from. And so when you start to look at what this administration in Washington has been able to do, appointing federal judges to the bench with no experience on the bench to lifetime judicial positions. These are the things that people need to understand and and figure out that everything has, like the laws laws of physics, that everything has an equal and opposite reaction. Even if you don't see it, trust me, it's there. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com backslash A-H-T-T. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. After the Bucks strike, protest, whatever you want to call it, uh, there was talk. I saw a lot of stuff on Twitter. Some people are like, you like you and me, I had the same reaction as you. I'm like, look, I like what they're doing here. I don't know how long this is going to last, but I like it. There was some talk saying to people, well, what is this going to do? What kind of change and impact is this going to have? And we saw some things, right? We saw that these players got the owners to be a little bit more accountable and have the 29 teams have these uh, arenas open for polling come no, come November to be used as poll sites. I think, personally, that is no small feat. That's a major thing. You talked just earlier about the importance of voting and getting people out to vote and, and having people vote on things, no matter how big or small it is. What do you like about what we saw come out of this 
strike protest uh, in the NBA. I think some people are poo-pooing it, pushing it to the side, but I think it's no small potatoes. This is huge in getting these arenas open for people to come and vote. I think it's incredible. I think sometimes we are our own worst enemies. We, we, we allow the perfect to be the enemy of the good, right? As opposed yep. to, as, and I'm not saying settle, right? I would never tell anybody to settle. I don't tell my daughters to settle. I don't tell anybody, like, like you should shoot for the stars, right? But if you look at what was accomplished in some of the, in some of the other things that, about a continued ongoing investment in communities of color, in, in, these impacted communities that they're going to get in, in addition to this, right? In addition to that, I don't think that's a, that's a small feat. And, and the reality is, I, I, I like to ask those who, like, okay, if not this, then what? Then what? Right. right. Exactly. Right. So, exactly. So exactly what you wanted them to do. You wanted them to turn this down and get what? Well, and most of the time, 99 times out of 100, when somebody's doing that, they're not going to be able to tell you mm-hmm. what it is that they would have asked for. To. They just know it's not enough. Well, what mm-hmm. is then? Well, it's not enough. Well, that's not an answer. You know, you know what that's like? <laughs> You know what that's like? That's like the people who, whenever LeBron James says something, they bring up China. Not because they actually care about China, but they're just deflecting because they just want to bring up China in order to invalidate or feel like they're invalidating everything else he's saying, uh, regardless of what it is. Yeah, and it's 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 just real disappointing when you see when you see people turn to that and and do that. So, with that being said, I think a lot of other talk that we that comes out of this, um, Jamal, and what we've seen over the last couple of years is, okay, police reform is needed. I know you're somebody that's really, really pushing for that and that we need to look at ways legislation can be passed to help certain issues of police brutality and police reform and anti-racism and all these things that we need. What do you see in politics right now, especially at the local level, including, and you could bring up some of the stuff that you're working on and you're doing and you're fighting for, what are you seeing being done that you can let people know that, to go to Brian's point, we can't just rely on the athletes. We need people like Jamal Bailey. We need you. Yeah. So what what is it that you and, and uh, others are doing out there to fight and put, push some legislation forward? Well, we got to be able to walk and chew them at the same time, right? Um, so one of the things is the police reform. Uh, you heard the conversation about the phrase 50A, yes. right? Repeal mm-hmm. the 50A, that was my, that was my bill. Uh, it was to repeal subsection 50A of the Civil Rights Law. And what that did is serve as an impenetrable bar to getting – the disciplinary records of uh, of officers who were who were accused of, of wrongdoing, right? I live in the Bronx, Northeast Bronx, um, where Marley Graham was shot and killed by by officers here in the North Bronx. Constance Malcolm, uh, an incredible an incredible woman, um, fought tooth and nail to try to get those records, but she didn't get those records if not for a leak, if not for some sort of happenstance. You're the victim of brutality. You shouldn't be able to. You shouldn't get that stuff based based upon happenstance. You should get it because it's the right thing to do and fosters public trust. It allows us in communities who've often been over policed to to know who is it that's policing us, right? In any other profession, if you have this this many disciplinary records, you know, strikes in your record, you you know you can you're dealt with and taken care of, and and you and and now that maybe you're disciplined, maybe you're Maybe your behavior is corrected, but this isn't happening because we don't know doing it. They're continuing to be on the force, and that is continuously leading to a distrust from people in the community and members of law enforcement. Like you go into these schools, you talk to the kids. I mentioned it before. Like nine times out of ten, you ask the kid what they want to do. They in that top three is doctor, lawyer, basketball player, cop. Right? They're still saying that they want to be police officers. So where does the disconnect happen? Disconnect mm-hmm. happens when officers that are not held accountable continue to come into our communities and, and over police us for the sake of over policing. So we need to know who those folks are. Um, special prosecutor bill. Um, they, they're, you know, when is a police involved killing, right? Yeah. You want an impartial individual. And that's nothing, not to cast aspersions against any other, in, any individual district attorney, but the attorney general as the chief law enforcement officer in the state has jurisdiction over. So now Letitia James, you know, our first African-American woman DA, I mean, AG. In the Bronx, we have a first African-American DA statewide in Darcel Clark. Darcel Clark. Like, so it's important that we continue to break these barriers as, as they go, as we go up. But the point is with, with, with that is that they have the ability to, to investigate these killings. Um, the anti-chokehold uh, bill, the Eric Garner bill, which is different from the New York City one, 
Um, that passed in the state unanimously. And that passed 62 nothing in New York State Senate, a house that is often divided based upon partisanship. Every Republican and every Democrat in New York State Senate voted for Senator Brian Benjamin's bill to, uh, to, 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 uh, to, to ban chokehold at the state level and to put a, and to put a uh, penalty on. It was, it's, it's a realization that, look, whatever side of the aisle you sit on, right, you have to make a, rec is a recognition that we've got to do more when it comes to making sure that we reform our police departments and, and restoring public trust and accountability to the equation. Yeah. Do you think that over the course of this year that we've actually legitimately have gotten closer to some sort of reform in these areas that we're discussing? Do you think that we've actually made legitimate progress over the last you know six months or however long it's been? Absolutely. I, I, I think that so in, in, the first, in the second week of June, we passed these bills and the governor signed them into law. Um, so we passed a package of 10, of 10 bills. I was a sponsor on four of these bills, um, uh, including 58 special prosecutor, a weapons discharge bill, and a bill that was dedicated to the life of Andrew Kearse, a, Bl a Bronx man who was refused medical attention while in custody, which, 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 in, in which, and again, these are things that you would think would be, like, why wouldn't this be permitted? Why would this be permitted? It would create a right of civil action so that in the event that an officer failed to um, try to get, you know, Somebody who's in their custody. So, Brian, in, in, in some in substance, we've been able to do that. But yeah. we've been able to do that uh, as much as I think I'm a pretty good elected official. It's not just because of me. Right. It, it is because the people, they saw that knee on the neck of George Floyd for eight minutes and 46 seconds, the collective knee of black America. And they said, yo, we are tired. We've been telling you about this for so many years. Mm-hmm. But by the grace of God and by the grace of video evidence, we have undisputable evidence because in the past, you know, some people, it was like a throw context out there, right? Uh -huh. Well, Eric Garner, well, look, hey, he was choking him out, but maybe he was resisting or maybe he was selling cigarettes or whatever cockamamie excuse they gave that why they, 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 they could have, they, they murdered that man in Staten Island, right? Right. This one, we saw evidence from the store. We saw evidence when George Floyd was on was on the ground when they brought him to the. At no point was he resisting. He was asking for help. There were bystanders recording it from multiple angles. We had the perfect storm of indisputable evidence that said, "You can't, yeah, I can't look past this one now. Now do right. something." Right. And as legislators, we are charged to do what the people's will is, whether we like it or not. I happen to be very passionate about this, so I'm happy that we did it. But as legislators, our number one job is to serve the constituencies that we represent, whether we feel good about it or not. And our collective constituencies said, enough is enough. Do it. Do it. Now. Yeah. Yeah. And that's something that we've talked about up here. We just feel like if it, like, yes, people have been fighting for this for a long time. But this year, more than any other year that at least I've experienced, it just feels a lot different than in years past. So. Yeah, I, I, I definitely feel it, Jamal. I feel the energy behind it, and it, we need it from people like you. Just to flip a little bit back to sports real quick for a second, um, athlete activism. We've seen this for a couple of years, and you know Brian's kind of alluding to that, and we're seeing it extremely louder now with what we saw, what the Bucks did, and as you said uh, so perfectly, the women uh, in this country, the women of the WNBA um, and, and people in the other leagues as they have done, are you encouraged by the athlete activism that you've seen over the last couple of years and especially recently uh, this year following the death of George Floyd and others, unfortunately, but are you encouraged by that athlete activism that we've seen in this country? Absolutely. Because it, 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 it makes Laura Ingraham's shut up and dribble nonsense look even dumber, right? It, like mm -hmm. in every other aspect of life, we ask people to get civically engaged, but athletes, no, 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 just do this one job. That ball there, and right. that's it. Go home. It's 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 nonsense, right? And you know we like sports activism has like a storied past, right? Mm -hmm. Mahmoud Abdul Raouf, right? Mm -hmm. Craig Hodges, like 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 there's 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 a lot going back as in addition to you know Muhammad Ali and Colin Kaepernick, but there there are things that folks, if you're not a huge sports fan, you wouldn't know that that they were advocating for, right? And I think that. Now, I think that it's, just, it's not just one-off now. I think that the collective is being represented in, you know, 
and I think that it's a, I think it's great going forward. You know, I, I really, I'm really encouraged by these, these, these young folks, these young workers. And, I, and Dexter, when you said strike, I think strike is perfect because they're labor. These yes. are members of collectively bargained labor organizations. Just because they're young and predominantly black does not make them any less part of organized labor than anybody else. Let's just yep. let's be let's let's talk about that because you can't talk about loving unions and what unions do, but it's only certain people in certain unions mm -hmm. that you love. Let's, let's let's look at collective bargaining and what it is and what it's not. And what it is, these are workers. Right. Then they they withheld labor when they decided to not play. Um, and I think a lot of people are telling on themselves, Jamal, when they, like you said, they're pro-union, but when certain people strike, they don't like it. And I, I was actually really disappointed in a lot of media members, because you, I know you saw this too, and I know Brian saw this as well. A lot of people were calling this a boycott. This is not a boycott. This, this was a strike. It's a strike when you withhold labor. And I think th that needs to be uh, distinctly uh, brought about. And a friend of ours, Gerard Hector, had brought this up when we had a discussion too. And I thought it was great. Now you say that you are extremely encouraged um, in terms of athlete activism. But also, I'm sure you've got to be encouraged politically in terms of where things are going to. What more can we see, Jamal? What can we see in terms of legislation? Like, what's the work you feel like still needs to be done here to get us to where we want to go? Well, we need a lot more around economic development, all right? Uh, obviously, because, you know, we're in the midst of the, midst of the worst pandemic, and, and, let's, and let's not forget that, right? We need economic development because... The revenue is it's it's in our state it's really low, right? We don't know what the federal government's going to do, and they haven't exactly been kind to New York City or New York State, even though we give more money to the federal government than we get, but that's a conversation for a different day. Mm -hmm. um, we should we should be looking at other ways to be creative about about revenue, right? And if that means trying to make those at the very, very top, the well, the point zero one percent, make them pay a little bit more taxes, and that's something that we have to do. Um, we also should be looking at healthcare and the lack of healthcare and the, and, and the inequities in healthcare that happen. Um, when COVID nineteen hit, my colleagues and I wrote letters to multiple administrations, uh, state, local, federal, and we said, please be aware that in Black and Brown communities. This is going to hit harder because we are already we, we are already a step behind based upon certain societal inequities, based upon lack of coverage, um, economic uh, uh, disparities. And it hit, uh, you know, they, they say they said, hey, stay home. Well, what about people who um, work for 1199 and 32BJ and these other unions and these essential workers, nice and then these nurses and they and they quite literally could not stay home. Okay. About, spoiler alert, most of them folks are black and brown, black and brown women who were utilizing public transportation, who they said, avoid public transportation. Well, how am I supposed to get to work? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so we have we have to really come to grips with our healthcare system and try to figure out how do we get there, right? And do I know all the answers? Absolutely not. Am I trying to figure out, figure those things out? I think we should take a take a take a long look at what single payer could do at a state level. Uh, I know there's a significant fiscal cost to it, but there we should be looking at ways that we can kind of level the playing field on economic opportunity and healthcare opportunity. No, I think those are two things that are absolutely important. And before we get you out of here, one more one last question for you. Um, as we see the NBA season continue, WNBA continues to play sports. It looks like it's going to continue to go on. Um, I thought for me, I'll say this personally, when, and I think this is why you probably felt the same way, Jamal, when it came to the 26 and what we saw with the Milwaukee Bucks. The kneeling for the anthem and the Black Lives Matter shirt, that was all cool. I know we like that. But it started to become a little bit per performative. And I think that's why we got to this point where we had this strike. But as sports fans, for all of us here, what would you like to see athletes do more to support even you. We talked about what we want to see people do to support politicians, but would you like yeah. to see athletes do more in terms of working with you to you know, maybe shout out a Jamal Bailey, get in contact with a Jamal Bailey, like it in whatever city or district you, you're in. Uh, what would you like to see them do more as they continue to play these sports to terms to really be blended in with politics as best as they can? That would be awesome, right? Especially at a state and local level, because look, we, we know about what's happening in, in Washington. We all see the local news. But the folks who have, like, if you live in New York City, 
the people who have the 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 the, the, the most control over land use decisions are members of the New York City Council. I and people should know who their city council members are, right? If you're looking at things that are related to state issues, you should know who your state assembly member and who your state senators are, right? We tend to look at Congress and we tend to look at um, uh, DC stuff, Congress, Senate, and, and the presidency as the only game in town. And sometimes, and I can't blame them, you only have but so much time as an individual, as an athlete, as a person. So like, maybe you're tweeting about or, or you're coming to an event that relates to taking back the U.S. Senate, right? Or taking back the White House. But I would love it if, not just me, but if they went to, you know, local elected officials and they said, yo, how can I help? How can I come help you get, you know, get the census? Like, for example, the census, guys, yeah. like, we are undercounted at record levels. We have until September 30th, a full month less than what we're supposed to have to get counted. We're at 57%. New York State is on, par, is, on, is, on, is on the path to lose two congressional seats. So when you lose congressional representation, that makes these congressional districts larger. And if it makes the congressional district larger, if you don't think that you have the ear of your Congress member now, wait till they have to represent more people. And it's not because they don't want to represent you. It's because there are finite amounts of resources and availability that they have to be able to do. People should be able to be represented by people who know them and can reach out and touch them and their staff members. Shout out to staff, by the way. Always got to make sure you represent. That's right. Because yeah. as an official, you are only as good as your staff. So I want to make sure we're very clear about that. Shout out to my staff. I call them the Bailey Bunch, you know? Um, <laughs> but, but like, it would be amazing if these elected officials, excuse me, if if elected officials helped out everywhere, but if athletes came, went, went to their local um, areas where they were from, like Todd Gibson, for example. Shout yes. out to Todd Gibson. Yep. Because, you know, like, and he's he's talking about it from both sides. And I and, and look, we got police reform problems, but we got gun violence problems too. Gun violence is a public health crisis, and it's an epidemic. Todd is back in Brooklyn trying to help out with that. So he's somebody that that's not just shooting the breeze about it, but he's going to be about it, right? Like, like I think that that should be replicated in every city, town, ward. Like, for example, Flint, Michigan, has always been like they used to call it the ball place made of Flintstones, right? Like, mm -hmm. like, we need them. We need them in Flint, right? right? We need them talking about that. Kinston, North Carolina. Uh, oh, like we, we need we need Brandon Ingram to go back to North Carolina. Um, we like, and it's not saying that these folks aren't doing it because because maybe they're doing stuff on a level that maybe we're just not not aware about. But yeah. I like to see them. You know, what can we do? And how can we be of help to our state and local elected officials? Yeah, I think we all can't ignore that. We can't ignore our state, local elected officials. I'm so glad you brought that up. So glad Great. to have you on here, Jamal. We we're glad to talk to you. We'd love to have you to come back. I'm sure there's going to be more stuff to come back. We're going to talk about how sports intersect with politics because you know some people are trying to tell us they don't intersect, but we know that sure. is, we we know that isn't true, brother. We know that's not true. Absolutely. Fellas, thank you for having me. This was this was great. I, 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 as an elected official, you try not to make promises, but I can make one promise today. I want to. I definitely want to come back on, man. Oh, we sure. we appreciate that. We be more than it be more than our pleasure to have you. That's Jamal Bailey, New York State Senator for District Thirty Six, representing the Bronx. Um, thank you. He putting the X up for Wakanda and for the Bronx. So they they at the same time too. So I like it, Jamal. Thank you, my brother. Appreciate it. Appreciate you guys. Thank you. One time for your mom, one time. One time for your mom, one time. One time for your mind this week. We are back at it. I know Brian has something that he wants to talk about in terms of the world of hip hop that also kind of correlates a bit with podcasts. And then I'll have something to share as well, too. Brian, what you got? So for this one time for your mind, uh, Joe Budden is leaving Spotify, which he has said on his, poc in his podcast. He's taking his podcast. He's leaving Rory, Maul, Parks. They're all going, you know, uh, save all, everybody. So basically, there's this whole thing about, like, what's going to happen now and why he's leaving. And obviously, people are going to talk about it, as I'm about to do right now. Charlemagne was one of the first people to obviously respond. Him and Joe Budden have this sort of, I guess, complicated public relationship, if you want to call it that. But they're friends, but they also go at each other because they just don't really see eye to eye on certain things. And here's why. Um, you know, when they were talking about it on The Breakfast Club, it was brief. DJ Envy, who 
was one of the other people on the Breakfast Club who commented on Joe Budden saying that he was going to leave Spotify on an episode of his podcast that came out last week. He basically said, it's like, in talking about Joe Budden, DJ Envy said, it's like, you know, when you're saying you're leaving, when you're saying you're going to walk out the door, but you really don't have anywhere to go. And, you know, Charlemagne basically called Joe Budden a man that knows his worth but doesn't know how to properly negotiate it with uh, – but doesn't know how to properly negotiate it. And he also said that amidst all of this, if you're having issues here at Complex and here, whatever the case may be, that you're probably the problem, which is how a lot of people, I guess, would feel. And I was actually surprised at this, that Charlemagne doesn't quite get it from the standpoint of what Joe Budden's talking about. And here's the difference. There are – Different kinds of people, people who are the Stephen A. Smiths and the Charlemagnes of the world who really get in those positions of power in the, in the company that they're in, but do they have power really? Because at the end of the day, you work for ESPN, you work for iHeart, like you're getting a check from somewhere. You don't really own anything, and that's what Joe Budden's entire fight is for, is for ownership. A lot of people are questioning whether or not he should be actually – you know, leaving because he's under contract with Spotify and they're taking care of him and, you know, whatever the case may be. And I think that we do too much generally of questioning the people who are trying to question the system instead of questioning the systems themselves. We're conditioned to think a certain way. We're conditioned to think that we need these companies in order to push our stuff to the next level and pay us. And when you get to a certain point, that's not true anymore. Like Joe Budden, I don't think, needs Spotify. And the thing is, if you really boil it down, it makes a lot of sense why he would leave because – He talked about this on his podcast. Amy Schumer came in around the same time. I think they started a little bit earlier. Amy Schumer, if you remember, because I remember this because I was sitting on the train and I saw the billboards or whatever you want to call that on the train. It's not necessarily a billboard, but you know what I mean. Uh, They were advertising Amy Schumer's podcast a lot. Spotify put money into that. I don't remember the name. I don't even remember the name of the podcast. I, I, I looked it up. Apparently, it's still going on. It's seasonal. I didn't know that either. They underperformed. That was supposed to be like the first exclusive sort of deal. And to Joe what, I'm point, cutting you off here. What do you mean that they underperformed by that? Uh, Amy, Amy Schumer's podcast. How so? How, so? how did it underperform? Do because we know? Because it, it wasn't – numerically, I don't know. But it wasn't okay. – it was supposed to be like one of the main podcasts that was there. And then Joe Budden was supposed to tap into a different audience. And according to him on their podcast, they outperformed their projections by 900%. Amy Schumer, not so once. They were the number one podcast on Spotify at the end of their first year. I believe probably at the end of their second year, too, uh, or they're in their second year now. But you get you get it. They're one of the biggest podcasts in the world. And what he's basically saying was that – and that's a licensing deal that he has. And what I've seen, at that point, Spotify wasn't really – tapping into podcasts like that. They were just trying this out with Amy Schumer, with Joe Budden, whatever. Now they have all these exclusive deals, Gimlet, the Ringer network of podcasts where they have the wire way down in the hole, R2C2, Bill Simmons, and all of his conglomerates, Ryan Rossillo, et cetera, et cetera. Um, And Spotify now has a lot more exclusive podcasts, and I feel like Joe Budden is kind of the one that effectively started that trend or made it successful there on Spotify. So I do think that they should be entitled to a certain amount. But regardless, they're going to be successful wherever they go. And I just think generally we need to question these systems and why we don't question them. I don't understand because a lot of people want to get to certain positions and companies. But I think really the goal should be to work with them to a point. But you also want to, if not get a piece of the pie there, you want to have your own projects on the side. You want to have that anyway. But at the end of the day, you want to have some level of ownership and not just work 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 to get your money because Charlemagne you could argue he's underpaid because of what he's done at the breakfast club what he's done at a radio station but their radio station is also converted into podcasts and he has all these other shows but you could argue that Stephen A. Smith that ESPN is underpaid even though he's making 10 million because of what he does on all these platforms and I get Joe Budden's fight entirely and I'm surprised that you know Charlemagne was a doesn't just see it the same way so here's my thing on this. I don't necessarily, I do, obviously I agree with the, you know, going for ownership and, and creating your own, all that stuff. I'm a big supporter of that. I, I, when I read Charlemagne's comments, I understood some of what he was saying, right? This is where I felt Joe was wrong. 
Joe mentioned Joe made he the he compared himself he compared to the, the Amy Schumer comparison was the best comparison he gave because that's a, a one one person on a podcast so it's no disrespect to Rory Mall, but Joe Budden's the reason people are coming there. And he compared it to Amy Schumer. And if Amy Schumer underperformed and Joe Budden overperformed, which I would be inclined to assume that that is correct, even though I don't have facts and figures on that, I could assume that that's correct. Let's say that's well, correct. Impa- if you measure impact, which is probably the biggest measurement in terms of that those those podcasts, then yeah, it's yeah, a landslide. I would, yeah, I think we all could think. Not, and no disrespect to people who like Amy Schumer's podcast, not saying yeah. anything about that. Yeah. When he compared, when he compared himself to. Gimlet and the ringer and stuff like that. I understood Charlemagne's point, which was you're comparing yourself against things that have multiple IPs and the value for those, the way that the way Spotify is going to look at valuing those companies with multiple yeah. IPs is going to be different in the way they look at valuing the Joe button podcast. That does not mean to say that the Joe button podcast could not potentially be undervalued. Not saying that at all, but what I'm saying is I understand why they may look at it as a difference in value. And I'll let you, I'm gonna let you. I'm gonna let you respond, B. So don't worry. I'm gonna let you respond. Yeah, one yeah. other. One other thing that I thought Joe, not Joe Budden. Excuse me. Well, let Charlotte. me correct the last thing. You okay, said. go ahead. Yeah, correct me. Yeah. Because Joe Budden said, not to correct, because you're not wrong in what you're saying, but according by Joe Budden's account, which he responded to in the podcast in the last one, what he was basically saying was that Spotify wanted all of it, meaning they wanted the pull-up series that he does. They wanted. You know, ah. uh, other whatever, like whatever other content that was going to come from the Joe Budden podcast, they basically wanted as part of whatever new deal. And his whole fight was, why would I do that? That was his response. Like, yeah. Why OK. Would OK. Because he wants to go to he he believes that Joe Budden is a network. And, you know, it is Joe Budden has become its own sort of network because there are multiple things going on at the same time to pull up the podcast, whatever the case may be. Well, let whatever me, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me ask you this though. Yeah. Did in him saying that, cause I didn't hear him say and, and the last part, he wants to, he was saying that Spotify, it doesn't make sense for him to house all of his things and what in that place. I could, I could, yeah, but yeah, I, I, I it's can. Not, it's like he would want to house all of his all of his things in one place. And by the way, all this aside, he does mm-hmm. still have the revolt job. He's still right, at, right, 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 that. right, right, right. And so that I'm glad you brought that up because that does give some perspective here. Because if if he's saying that uh, Spotify wanted him to bring his other entities, like pull up and things he have in, has in there, what I would say if I was him, and I guess this is kind of the point he was making. Then if he's saying to me, then I want to then be valued as the ringer and these other places like that, I saying. understand that argument completely. And then that's a different argument. And I and I yeah. would so I, I appreciate you bringing that up. And and you know you're right. You corrected me on that because I did not have that information. So I yeah. agree with that. The one thing I will say about and because I don't think I'm against what Joe Budden ever was saying. Um, if he was comparing himself to the the entities that had multiple IPs, I was saying I didn't think it was balanced. But if he's saying what he said, which is they're asking me to bring these other entities in, then he's right. Then he is a network just like these other places. And if he's, he can has, and he's got the numbers better than us and he knows what his influence and reach has been and what is done from day one, then that's fine. One thing I will bring up and I'm really intrigued to hear how you respond to it. Charlemagne bringing up about his attitude and how he acts with other companies. I also think there's some validity to that for Joe. And as much as I like Joe Budden, and I think what he's fighting for in this and standing up for is admirable. I do think maybe sometimes how he goes about it in a way is different. What he said in his podcast to what Brian has brought up, I don't have a problem that you should speak your truth. We are about that on this podcast. Yeah. Him putting out the tweet where it's like, yo, fuck you, Spotify. Eh, that's a bit much. He's, yeah. And he's got to be mindful of those relationships and how that builds with him going to the next place or other places. So you don't want that that idea out there that you're difficult to work with and we know we get labeled as that as people of color i'm not saying don't speak your truth i'm not about to not being silenced and shucking and jiving for these folks i ain't about that anybody who knows us knows we're not about that but you know there are certain ways that whether it's myself or brian or anybody else you know if we're trying to do something to get a deal with somebody and we're or we're moving on for a deal with somebody Yo, move on with grace. You ain't got to be all about the fuck you Spotify. And Joe Budden, I think, knows that he was wrong for that because he then deleted the tweet for me to be fair. So I think he knows like there's a better way to handle that. I think Charlemagne's point in that is fair. I can't speak to Joe Budden's other deals. 
I don't know, but I think how he's approaching things going forward, knowing your worth, we're with you, brother. Yeah. Handling yourself while knowing your worth is something that also needs to be respected too. That's yeah, it. And, yeah, and that's something. I See, that tweet I've forgotten about until you brought it up. Huh. And that he deleted, so that's funny that you bring that up. But yeah, I mean, you know, he can burn a bridge or two or three. You know what I mean? It's happened before. Um, that You know, that's something that's a balance that I – try to look out for like i i don't feel like i've ever burned a bridge before uh even even with you know the sb nation that's daily stuff you know what i'm saying i don't feel like i've burned a bridge there necessarily i've just kind of spoken out and be like yo here's the deal here's what goes on at places like sb nation or whatever the case may be you know what i mean like and we're, again it's more so challenging the system like why do people feel like they have to be conditioned to accept the stipend for x amount of like who whose decision was it to to give away or to 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 give somebody a few hundred dollars for 30 articles a month you know what right. i mean well, like well, it's, it's my thing is just it's just systemic but to the joe button point mm-hmm. it's like yeah i mean you probably want to do it a little more consciously uh, consciously or so, but still, I respect everything he's doing. Obviously, you know that his podcast is one of the only ones that I don't miss an episode of. I actually only have two uh, two shows like that that I don't miss an episode of. The other one is Levitard's show. Uh, and then, you know, obviously there's ours, but I'm here all the time, so, you know, it is Yeah, you it have is. not missed an episode yet. Thank, thank right. you. Yeah. <laughs> Thankfully. But, like, but yeah, I mean that that's pretty much what it is, but obviously tremendous respect and you know where wherever's the next move, uh I'm probably going to be there as a listener because I've been listening to that podcast for years. Yeah, and, well I well that's what we'll say. We are I am also intrigued to see what the next move is for him. I am and, I've, written, and I've written about him uh 3 years ago in that story that he reposted too about how he's become the most impor- most important voice personality in hip hop. Hip hop personality you said, right? Yeah. And 3 years later I mean, it still it still holds to be, it still holds to be yeah. true. And look, I agree with you um, completely that Joe Budden does not need Spotify. Um, I, I do think there's something admirable in him being able to step out and know his worth. I was literally just saying that to another friend of ours in the podcast. We were talking about that today about knowing your worth, and yeah. that is you know we've brought that up many times this podcast. You have to know it, but I will say I do think you got to conduct yourself with a way that you know opens yourself up to more opportunities while you still speak your truth. Ultimately, he'll be fine. He'll be fine. Yeah. yeah. As as I spoke about earlier in this podcast, uh, the past week has been very emotionally draining for a lot of people in this country, particularly black people in this country. Um, I can definitely say that the last week has been particularly draining for me. Not because I'm black, as I will say again. I love being black. But it's emotionally draining living in this country of the United States of America, which is extremely racist and has had a long racist history. And this is also draining for our other allies, our other other folks of color, our Latino brothers and sisters, Asian, uh, what, you know, native indigenous folks in this country. They see this stuff as, as when you see what happened to Jacob Blake, it's very draining. But then on top of that, uh, and, I, and I'm not speaking for all the black community, but I'm speaking for myself. Uh, to learn early this weekend the the death of Chadwick Boseman, man, that really hit. That really hit, and I know it hit for a lot of uh, black folks because you think of the important, iconic roles that he's played as a black man and what he accomplished in such a short period of time at the age of 43. Uh, for people watching this podcast, you see I'm wearing a Black Panther shirt. You can see I got Black Panther, Chadwick Boseman, uh, iconic role that he played, probably be one of his best known roles right behind me. Um, we spoke on this podcast after I saw Black Panther and how important it was for me to see that, how important I knew it was for young black kids to see that. I grew up never seeing a black superhero. Brian has still sadly never seen a Latino superhero featured, prominent featured. And we're hoping that day comes for our Latino brothers and sisters. And I'll be right there watching when that comes. But it's because of people like Chadwick Boseman and what we see and how they play in those roles, it's important. And when that person comes for the Latino community and for the Asian community and others, people are going to have that same level of pride that I'm talking about right now. That's why these things mean so much. Him playing Jackie Robinson, one of my idols in sports, somebody I've always looked to as a role model because of what he stood for in sports. James Brown, great iconic musician. These are the roles Chadwick Boseman played. And when you think about him doing that stuff at such a high level, 
uh, this in his, his career, what he meant, man, it's a lot. And I think for black folks and myself to, to lose one of our heroes, we lost the Black Panther, as people have called him. We lost the Black Mamba earlier this year. This stuff really touches, especially when we see our brothers and sisters and people of color being killed in the street at the hands of police or not being killed and paralyzed like Jacob Blake. It hurts. And, you know, we heard Jamal Bailey earlier in this episode talk about when is enough going to be enough? That is the question that people are asking. That is what people want to know. That's why we have to use our voices. That's why Brian has to speak his truth. I have to speak my truth. You, the listener out there and viewers, have to speak your truth because there are people out. you can leave a mark. You don't have to be Chadwick Boseman in a movie, but we all have a part to play. We all can touch people's lives the way Chadwick Boseman touched mine, Kobe Bryant may have touched mine, or whoever your heroes out there may have touched yours. It's that representation that matters, that seeing somebody that looks like you can do something, even if it's not in the field that you do. And that stuff matters. So I just want to give a salute to, in what's been a difficult time for people, to Chadwick Boseman for what he did and the impact he left, particularly on the black community, and will continue to leave, excuse me, leave in his presence for years to come. Um, I know I will feel it. I know my daughter has a Black Panther toy, and she doesn't even watch a Black Panther movie, but I'll watch it with her and share with her about Chadwick Boseman and what what he meant uh, to the community and what he's done. So salute to Chadwick Boseman, uh, everything that he did in his career. Uh, Black Panther is had a great legacy, and uh, Wakanda forever. That's how I'm ending this podcast. That's it for episode 144 of the Ain't Hard to Tell podcast. Speak your truth. Be strong. Until next time, y'all. Peace.